So I'm handing off the floor to Sarah, who will be giving a quick little introduction, and, and we'll follow up with a fireside chat. So everyone, welcome to Sarah at Yale. Woo! How close I need to be because my voice is very quiet, so I might have to hold this. Um, but thanks everyone for being here. Um, the irony of all of this, so besides AV not working in a talk about tech and entrepreneurship, um, is that Seth and Teo asked me to speak about um, how to make the most of college. And I actually left high school. I didn't make it past graduation, and I also dropped out of college. So. Um, ironically, I think that gives me kind of a perspective on, you know, what I missed out on. And I have, like, you know, some regrets and some thoughts on how to make the most of your time here, even if it is one or two semesters. Um, so by the time I was 21, I'd raised $27 million from Andreessen Horowitz, Bain, YC. Um, and you probably haven't heard of my company because we are enterprise software. Um, we essentially sell developer tools to companies like Burberry and Amazon. Um, and essentially, we power a lot of stuff behind the scenes. So um, this form of entrepreneurship you know, can take many different forms. Um, so the reason I dropped out of school, I think it, it kind of takes like um, a lot of explaining. So I'll start at the beginning. I grew up in Atlanta, um, in Georgia, uh, had a very quiet childhood, was mostly interested in arts, and also did a lot of sports. Um, I'd say a lot of the stuff you do when you're younger really shapes you into the type of founder you might become because um, for me, I did swim, basketball, and golf um, pretty seriously, and each of those sports kind of taught me something small. Um, and so growing up in Georgia, did all of that, and then actually like had a small shakeup in my life when my parents suddenly moved us to California. So that was when I was 13. Um, up until then, you know, had a pretty rigid view of what I might do with my life. I was like, maybe I'll be a consultant, um, stay in Georgia, go to school here. Um, when we moved to California, I, I got exposed to like a lot, like a lot of um, competition, like California high schools are much more, um, like people are more talented, there's like a bigger population. And you'll find the same with Yale. Like I think anywhere where there's high achieving people, you'll always find someone who is technically better than you. Um, same with startups, like there will always be someone with more money in their bank who has a higher valuation, but that's not what matters, right? Um, so that was a key lesson there. Um, ultimately, I actually didn't get into coding until I was 16. Um, so I know a lot of people, the thinking is you need to be um, some child prodigy to um, start a company young. Um, I started my company when I was 19, um, so only like three years after I learned to code. Um, and actually, the reason I learned to code was really silly. It wasn't because I was um, some smart like STEM kid. I actually, my younger brother, he's about four years younger. Um, he skipped like seven or eight grades of math. So I was always like, I had this weird um, complex where I thought I was just dumber than him. And my parents actually sent him to a coding camp when I was a sophomore. Um, and I needed to go to a swim camp and get an instructor for me to you know, get into um, certain qualifying rounds for college. So I was really upset because, you know, it felt like um, it was a zero sum game. They were just gonna give the budget to my brother who was still in middle school. Um, so that frustrated me and out of spite, I was like, I'm gonna teach myself how to code secretly and just beat him at this. Because to me, everything was like a competition. Um, so I actually, my first exposure to coding was through this like comic book. It was, I think called Caveman's Guide to C++. Um, and it was, it was pretty interesting. Like it made the concepts really digestible. Like coding is ultimately just putting together different pieces of logic. It's like we all think logically, you just have to tell a computer how to do things. Um, so that really spoke to me. At the time, like I didn't have a CS class in my high school. So um, CS felt like this secret thing I was just doing. Um, so it was fun. And then I had to figure out how to go from the book to the application, like how do you even use a compiler? So that's when I got into using Stack Overflow, going online, um, and once I built that first project, this I built like this little app based on the guide in the book. Um, that's kind of what got me hooked um, in coding. Um, so I think the lesson from that really is you want to make sure you get a dopamine hit early on when you're learning something um, so that you keep that flywheel going. So for me, that happened pretty quickly when I was 16. I ended up getting into open source coding. So I found um, some people online who were building cool stuff and 
Um, with open source, I'm not sure if you guys have dug into that, but it's a very like open community. People are sharing. It reminds me a lot of college actually, because with open source, people aren't making money from the stuff they're building versus when you start a company, like I can't just go to another like CEO and be like, can I learn this from you? Like they're gonna think I'm trying to steal something. Um, so basically I got into that when I was 16, 17, started building stuff. Um, these various like various developer frameworks. So it actually got me into what I'm doing today. Um, and I started tweeting um, and writing a bit about what I was building just for fun. And that's actually, um, there's, it's funny because uh, there's like, so Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal has this fellowship called the Thiel Fellowship. And the way they identify people for that is very similar to model scouting, um, where they're just like looking at you know, what people are posting online, like what kids are up to. And I just got an email one day when I was like 17 um, from one of the Teal Foundation people. And they're like, we saw your work online. Like, you want to come up and meet Peter Teal and, um, you know, just meet some other kids and interview for this thing. Um, so that was the first time I actually got exposed to the idea that you may not need school for the things you want to do. Um, obviously, I had to tell my parents I needed to go up to SF. It was actually like a Wednesday. Um, they, they emailed me, I think, on like a Friday. Um, so I had to skip school, tell my parents, and they were just really confused. Like, you know, Peter Thiel is a big name, like he founded PayPal, but they weren't happy about me going up to take money to leave school. And it's only actually, like the Thiel Fellowship doesn't give you enough money to really live off of. It's just um, 50K a year for two years. And so they were like, this is silly. Um, but I went up anyways and met a lot of interesting characters because a lot of kids who are in the fellowship who interview for it. They, um, they left, like some of them left high school when they were like 14, 15, started companies. Um, you can imagine like the sorts of people you meet if you know, they're doing that stuff. And a lot of them are actually international. And so basically I went to the summit. Um, it was an interview, Peter Thiel was there. It was maybe like 50 kids. Um, and I met one kid who was building something I found pretty interesting. So I decided to actually join him on his. Um, and so I left high school early because of that. So I moved up to the Bay Area, um, ended up finding, um, like just crashed at some hacker house, uh, multiple actually. And, you know, people have enough goodwill in San Francisco where they'll let you stay for free for like a month at a time. So I basically month to month kind of moved around and helped build this app that essentially um, lets you, it's, it lets you auto appeal like parking tickets, legal fees, all sorts of things. And that's possible through um, what's called like robotic process automation. So um, scripts on like that, uh, just automate actions on screens. And so that's what I did for like about half a year helping um, this other kid. We kind of got like a group together and we actually rented out um, the Facebook house in Menlo Park. So where Zuck went, it's actually like, I think you can rent it for I think 15K a month. So um, if you want to live that dream, you can. Um, so that was, it was a really dreamy time for me. and. Um, I actually decided, it took me a while to really decide I want to go to college because um, after a bit I realized like uh, being a dropout engineer in the valley is only fun for so long because ultimately you get pigeonholed into that, right? You, like, you can kind of see like the 10 year horizon, like maybe you become a senior engineer, maybe you start a company, but that's all you'll know. It's like way too early when you're 16 or 18 to make that sort of decision. And so I actually chose to go to college to broaden my horizons. Um, so I went to Harvard. I didn't go to Yale, but I came here a lot for Harvard Yale, so I have good memories. Um, and yeah, it was it was a great time. And I think um, for me, there are kind of three three things I think about um, in terms of like what I wish I did more at college. So I think it's like three C's: community, um, curiosity, and then chaos. So I'll kind of explain each of that. Um, so first year community, I think um, like literally. Uh, the team at Yes is hosting this program for you guys to get to know each other. I know there's this like system where you'll get to talk to like eight other people in depth and um, there's a high chance you might find your co-founder here. Um, most, like I didn't actually find my co-founder in college, I actually found them through the open source community, but most people I know found their co-founders um, at college in their first year. Um, so I think this is like a pretty critical time if you're interested in starting a company. Um, and I think like, you know, it's it's about the sort of like random chance encounters. Like I think I really miss those late nights. Um, those were the things when I left, I realized like shit, like you never really get that anymore. 
um, in the real world, like when you're working, especially when you're starting a company, you're not going to just wander into someone's apartment and uh, like smoke a joint or like, you know, hang out. Um, so that I think you should 100% maximize. It's worth the sleep deprivation because you'll get more of that after college too. Um, and so that's community. I think there's a lot you can do there. Um, with curiosity, that's one thing where I came to college intentionally to just like explore more than CS. And so I think Yale and Harvard are both great places where um, you can explore interests like agriculture, like um, fashion, anything culture. Um, ultimately, when you're starting a company, you have to draw from a lot of disciplines and like you need to, I think the best um, skill you can learn in college is how do you like weave these different threads together because ultimately, even if you start like a software company, I'm in enterprise software, which is extremely like old, outdated. Um, you still need to like draw on like your understanding of history, like software history, right? And you need to understand how people tick. Like psychology actually is really important in business, um, especially like with negotiation and some of the tougher things. Um, and so like with these things, definitely, I think I wish I had taken even more diverse classes. Um, I do think the structure of college, like I, I'm not the biggest fan of how college is structured. Like why is it four years? Like why is it, you know, um, I think it's four classes per semester. Um, if you can, I think you should try to diversify. And in your first year, do not optimize for credits. Do not optimize for um, the like major you think you want to go into. I think the first year you actually, the benefit of being in school is you don't have to optimize and you can actually make a lot of mistakes. and. Um, you know, when you're older and running a company and responsible for people's lives, like there's very low margin for error and exploration. Um, so highly advise that. And then the last thing, chaos, I think that's something where um, it's really like, I think I look back and I'm like, the parties were fun, the people were fun. Like you wanna just go, t like let yourself gravitate towards um, whatever you find fun, uh, because ultimately that'll tell you what gets you to tick because once you're in, like, once you're working, I found this even in my first, like, real um, internship. So I did work at Snap. Um, it's like you, you sort of, you get put into a job, you're told to do something, um, and you might tell yourself, a lot of people trick themselves into thinking they love banking or they love tech. And, like, maybe that's true, but um, that's just, like, one facet of yourself. And then ultimately, you just, like, don't get the opportunity to realize and, like, learn about yourself. So. Actually, ultimately college, it's really about taking the time to understand yourself um, so that when you start a company, um, you know exactly like what's gonna keep you motivated. Um, and the final thing I'd say is um, you really wanna think about like why to start a company because a company is a very long journey. So I've been working on this for four years now. Uh, if you told me when I was 19, like, you know, when I was fundraising, um, from all these people, like meeting with like Sequoia, Andreessen, like they'll all expect you to say, I'm gonna work on this for 10 years, it's my life mission. Um, and the company will evolve over time. Like the people you hire, the mission you're going after, um, it's inevitable. Like even the biggest companies in the world, like the first version of what they were is very different from what they are now. Um, and so it's like, when you're like 19 or 18, your perspective of time is very different, right? Like four years is a hell of a long time, 10 years, even longer. Um, and you might tell yourself you are down to commit to something before you start it, um, but you really have to like just remember why you're doing things and have a strong conviction. Um, so yeah, that's those are kind of the key themes I take away from this. Um, I think in the fireside we'll go over more um, in-depth examples from my startup journey. All right, okay. Thank you for your patience. We're gonna get started. Um, another round of applause for Sarah for that opening speech. All right, so I'm super excited to get the chat to you with you today. Um, I guess I wanted to open it up connected to what you said in the opening speech sort of each founder story needs a why, right? And you sort of touched on that a little bit, but I want to give you a chance to maybe speak a bit more on that. Sort of what was it that made this journey worth it for you? Yeah, so part of um, the whole thesis behind the company and the things we build, so at this point we have a suite of products, um, we want to improve developer um, and business team productivity. So we build tools to enable teams. And so um, for me, like 
that was, you know, the early part of my journey was why, like learning to code. It was a very tedious process. Um, we're like quickly advancing towards a world where um, you don't have to be quote unquote technical. You just need to know how to use like no code tools or AI tools. Um, so obviously like, you know, if you study the history of computing, there's assembly language to like get the computers to understand you and it's become abstracted. Like I think Yale probably has like a JavaScript course or Python over time, there's gonna be some sort of no code tool. And so our goal as a company is to sort of advance that um, and make it easier for people to automate the work that they wanna um, get rid of. And so, um, yeah, for me, my personal philosophy around building tools is I prefer to be behind the scenes. So I'm not someone who's ever wanted to be famous. Um, I prefer to build tools that enable other people so that they can do that. Um, and yeah, I think for me, it gives me joy when I see people using what I've built. Um, and so uh, the dopamine kind of cycle that I wanna build for myself is people build things with my tools um, they, you know, write great testimonies. They're excited when I tell them I built this thing. Um, and that's the greatest joy I get is like when I meet people and they're like, oh wait, I like use your thing. And like, you know, it, it's not like I need to be the face of this tool, right? So um, those are sort of the quiet motivations I have. Yeah, your point about dopamine is great. And I think the thing is a lot of students sort of come into Yale, uh, into this ecosystem, being quite good at many things. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of this culture where you can learn from so much from other people, but sometimes there's this hesitancy, do I even want to start something new given I'm already good at this? So in your case, swimming in high school, do I want to pivot into sort of this more technical realm? How do you kind of take that, take that leap of faith and is that dopamine sort of mentality really at the core of it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of, um, like people don't like to start from scratch, right? You know you're good at something, it's like why do yet another thing? Um, you have to really shift your mindset. That's something I've learned um, over time is really enjoying the process. Um, especially like high achieving people, I'm sure all of you here, you'll realize that you just like the, uh, the feeling and like being able to look back and seeing that you came a long way um, or that you achieved something or grew a lot. And so growing a lot doesn't have to come from like a certain discipline, you just need to measure the distance you've come, not that you've like started from zero, like starting from zero is totally okay. It's more about like the distance you go. And so, um, especially I think in college, like you probably learn the fastest, like you have no hindrances, like no obstacles. You have a lot of, a lot more free time than any other time. So um, now is kind of the time to like think about what are all the like different possibilities for myself? Like maybe like if you've ever thought about being an artist or being um, like something that's not say like tech founder, you should just list that all out right now. Look at it, think about like, what's the minimum number of hours I should commit to understand if I wanna pursue this? Or like, what's the minimum number of hours to get decent so that it's like a skill in my toolbox later on? Um, so you can get to say, let's call it like, there's 0% and 100%, 100% meaning like you're the top 10 in the world at something. You can just get to 5% and that 5% will stay forever, right? You're not gonna forget how to, um, do something. So I really recommend just like building up tiny um, skill sets and things and an understanding of if that is, you know, what you want to pursue. So let's talk about that process then. Uh, my, my favorite book is Deep Work by Cal Newport. And I know that that's a concept you mentioned several times that you kind of incorporate into your schedule. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, yeah. I think deep work is pretty synonymous with flow state. Um, I feel like a lot of I feel like, you know, founders and um, tech people in general uh, talk a lot about grinding. It's not like the thing is flow state, you know, you get it with art, you get it in a lot of these like social studies, they talk about it, but it's the same with like tech or any like hard, um, hard skill. So um, tapping into flow state, I think it requires, it does require alone time for a lot of people. It requires big blocks of time. Um, and you really need to, like some people, you get it in the late hours, you just like suddenly feel like things are flowing. Um, flow state's kind of like, like subconscious. You, um, you need to really like understand what it feels like, what conditions to then tap into it. Um, and I think in general, um, you can create systems for yourself. So um, I actually look at my calendar, like my calendar is like the dashboard for my life, because that's exactly how I'm allocating time. And like time is the most expensive currency we all have, right? So um, I try to like literally clear out big blocks um, on certain days and times I know where I'll be in a decent headspace. 
um, and make sure that I have, you know, like for me, I have certain like scents I like, and some people it's like certain sounds, and I, you know, I use this thing called Endel Sound that has like certain um, like patterns of audio, but for everyone it's different. But I think for everyone, um, the calendar thing or the time thing is the same. You really need to understand like when is it that I have to like uh, be social and like when can I sort of clear out the time and um, go into my little like cave and do stuff. Um, so that's when you can tap into flow state. Yeah, and time is one of the scarcest resources sort of here on campus. Um, so many things to do, especially your first year, that um, it's often difficult to kind of figure out what it is that you need to do. So I guess coming into first year, I thought it was more about productivity, but I've kind of shifted my mindset into thinking more about doing purposeful stuff. How does that sort of, I know you mentioned sort of the power law when it comes to friendships. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of make your time purposeful as a broad question? Yeah, yeah. I think power law is pretty related. Like, I like to think of a framework where it's like you spend 70 to 80 percent of your time on what you know is going to move you forward. Um, and then the remaining 20, 30 percent, it's it should be totally serendipitous. Um, so like if you like I'm a very visual person, so I'm now I'm imagining my calendar. Right. Like there are blocks where it's like deep work. That's where you are committed to the thing that feels like your project at the moment, right? Maybe you are hacking on something, so you have chunks of time for that flow state. Um, but then you also wanna make sure you have empty, like white space for uh, the serendipitous stuff, where it's like maybe you just wander around campus or maybe you just book a one-way trip to, I don't know, Montreal, like somewhere random, where you maybe saw like a piece of architecture that spoke to you <laughs> online or had an interesting story. Um, like you can think of the white space as sparking, like chances to spark imagination, um, and to spark like different ways of thinking. Um, and so then you can bring that into your deep work block and apply that. So it's like a balance, right? You want to, you still want to spend 70 to 80% of your time in purposeful things where you know it's, um, you have like a goal and it's moving you forward. Um, and then the other stuff is, it's very, um, it's just like kind of high chaos or um, you really just want to make sure that you are okay if you're not a, like not productive in that time as well. But there's like a 1% chance there's a big unlock that you find in that time. Got it. So a lot of what we've been talking about is sort of personally how you kind of approach your time. I guess pivoting it into sort of a more institutional standpoint, how can, I'm curious to hear about, I know you mentioned you had two semesters in college, or, or was it one or two? Two semesters. Two semesters. Yeah. Um, how is it that you think institutions can sort of, like, like universities particularly, can actually support founders? And what do you sort of wish that you maybe had as a support network, which you maybe didn't? Yeah, um, I actually think, so over the years, I've kind of talked to a lot of people from different schooling systems. I really like the Canadian, like Waterloo system. Um, they basically, it's a five-year program, actually, and you do, I think, four to five different internships. So you basically take a gap. It's like all, like two learning semesters, one gap semester for working, and then two one two one. Um, and so I really think that, you know, uh, depending on how you feel, right, is it three semesters and one to work, one to explore? Um, you shouldn't think of it as eight semesters. You need to be in school with the summer for working. Like, I really think it's good to mix it up because everyone marches to their own beat. And I think uh, chances are maybe only 10% of you here will actually um, benefit from the standard system. Got it. And I would imagine that through sort of work experiences, you get to I guess I would say meet a lot of people, but sort of have a sense of how to communicate with those people. Um, you have a really great, great talk on partnerships. Um, and I love it so much because you kind of go up there and, and give such a simple sort of s sophisticated, but very kind of simple diluted version of what it means to approach partnerships. Can you maybe speak a little bit more about that and sort of how maybe that experience of working uh, as long as you were sort of cultivated that? Yeah, so um, he's referencing a talk I gave uh, basically, in the work that we do as a B2B SaaS company, we have to establish partnerships with companies much larger than ourselves, say like Amazon and Shopify. And when you're starting, you know, people, I obviously never talked about my age, like it's definitely not beneficial to tell someone at, say, Amazon, like the GM of partnerships, like, hey, I'm 19, I want to like do something with you guys. It's unlike school where age is like, oh, like, you know, give me advice. In the real world and partnerships, you want to... Um, you want to be like um, basically reverse engineer it so that they want to work with you. And the way you do that 
like it kind of goes back to really thinking about psychology and understanding people. Um, you need to think about how do you develop um, social clout in this like partnerships world. Um, and so for our company, we really relied on building up part, like small partnerships first with like notable logos um, or like companies who then grew into larger ones. And then we could essentially piggyback off of their brand. It was actually really easy for us. Um, we just spoke to a ton of um, folks on the content side, got them to write about us, and then you know LinkedIn, like the bigger companies or people at bigger companies would notice, and then they'd think we were much more legitimate than we were when we were like a five-person company. Um, but the takeaway from that, since I don't want to talk about enterprise SaaS too much, the takeaway is you have the Yale logo right now, and Yale logo is really powerful. Um, there are amazing alumni, like my, I know Michael Seibel's coming to speak, right? Um, the whole like Twitch gang was Yale. Um, a bunch of a bunch of founders. I think um, who was it? Like Adept is like they raised a bunch of money, a couple billion valuation. He's Yale. Um, like there's a ton of people. Ton, yeah. Yeah. So it's good to um, recognize that you can use this as a way to get in with people from the community. Um, but you also, I think the caveat is you want to be very respectful of time and very humble because um, I can tell you I get a lot of requests for advice, um, a lot of people who want my time and um, like I always want to help and I don't care what school you've gone to. Um, I don't have a strong affinity towards um, particular organizations but um, the best thing you can do is understand like what's going to make this person tick, like why would they want to help you. For me it's I like when people remind me of my younger self. It's like, okay, you're in a similar position. I felt like scared, I felt stressed. Like I want to make sure that I can help this person not feel that way. So typically I'll respond to emails and um, get on the call if I feel like I can you know, make a tangible difference in someone's like situation or life. Um, and so you wanna do the same. Like if you're reaching out to say like an MD at a bank who you, know, you wanna talk to them to get in for an internship, you don't want to position it as like, I went to Yale, so talk to me. You really want to use that as like a starting point, like, hey, like, you know, uh, you can remind them of their Yale time. It's like, I um, you're currently doing um, in these clubs or like right now it's like October and it's feeling like everyone else is like um, getting internships and I'm a bit behind and I'm feeling this way. Like you want to tap into the emotions, not just like this is, these are the things on my resume, right? So how long are those emails that actually stick with you? Oh yeah, it can range. I have gotten like extremely long emails where it's like I actually feel bad if I don't respond but it's still not speaking to me. So you can do that. If you want to write like a really long email, it might make someone feel bad um, and respond. <laughs> um, but usually it's like, it's. I think the best structure is quick TLDR on who you are. Um, the next paragraph is sort of like your situation remind them a bit of like tap into that psychology and then the final one is an ask. Um, it's even easy if you're like, hey, like would these times work for you? You always wanna leave with something actionable. Got it, so that's sort of over the email side. How would you approach that um, in person? And the word networking is something that sort of gets brought up a lot first year of college and it's a word that sort of has some connotations but it can kind of mean a different thing for everyone. So sort of what does, yeah. when you walk into a room with people you wanna to talk to, how do you, do you think of the word networking or do you sort of have a different approach to it? Yeah, I think my approach has changed over the years. I think networking in general gets a bad rap. It doesn't really change. Um, and then in work context, you you have to go to these trade shows and network so that you can get like customers, partners, things. You almost have, like for my sales team, they have a quota, which is unfortunate. Like they, they are working for me and their money and salary is dependent on them hitting a quota. But um, I think like ultimately human connections, it's really hard to like engineer. Um, you probably naturally feel uh, more like affinity or you feel um, like you get along with certain types of people more than others and that's okay. And so um, in general, my approach to networking today is say there's a room of, I think there's like a hundred people here, right? Um, you want to basically be, um, you want to give people your full attention. You don't want to have eyes roaming around the room um, that's, that'll basically just make the other person feel like you don't care and it's very off-putting. Um, but basically, person to person, if you don't sense that you, you know, naturally get along very well or have much, that's okay, you kind of just move on. Um, and so, in general, I'd say like, 
my goal when I go into a room, if the purpose is networking, is to try to just make a handful of deep connections, because ultimately those deep connections can get you to the people you need. Um, and so that's actually more powerful than trying to collect them all or like collect the LinkedIn's. Um, because for me, the best, like the way I raised money, the way I got some of our larger enterprise customers was through a deep connection or someone I really vibed with, maybe even just one time at a conference who was very enthusiastic to get me to the person that I needed to get to. And not from someone whose LinkedIn I got who um, is just like a hundred people in a room, got everyone's LinkedIn's, didn't get along with anyone particularly well, and they aren't gonna do me any favors. So you kind of have to, it's yet again, like the power law, except to the extreme. I think it's like uh, the ratio is probably like 90 to 10 versus like 70 to 30. You set me up quite well for my next question, which is your co-founder story and sort of was it sort of the meeting meeting this person you built you built this company with was this sort of at an event and sort of how quickly did you know that this is someone who you were willing to really get into this relationship with because it is a yeah. deep they say it's almost like a marriage it really is sort of a a large decision. Yeah, yeah, co-founding something with someone. I think like you know you can meet. Uh, prospective co-founder in school and you just don't realize the implications until you're like further down the line like I've um, known my co-founder for maybe almost a decade now um, you know have been working on various projects for I want to say seven to eight of those years and then on the company for four years and as co-founders it's not just the time like you actually spend more time with your co-founder than you do your SO and your family if you think about it during that amount of time. You also share social security numbers, you have to. Um, you share finances, like um, we share the same like certain like lawyers and accountants um, and that's really important to keep in mind, like you need deep trust. Um, and so for me, like I met my co-founder, we actually initially interacted with each other online through those open source communities. Plenty of people online actually didn't really know each other's ages or like whereabouts or anything. We just like coded stuff together um, with other people. And um, that was fun. There was um, a couple like semi-annual developer conferences we were both frequent. So um, we actually ended up meeting in person, getting along really well, became friends. Um, and keep in mind, it wasn't like, oh, it's not like, you know, relationships or love where it's like love at first sight. With co-founders, it's like, you have plenty of people you can work with and get along with. And so we each had like, you know, friends that we would work on projects um, with. Uh, but over time, like we found that, like for us at least, our skill sets were extremely complementary. Um, we also just like built, you know, Alloy, our company, was probably the seventh or eighth thing we built together. So things just like build up over time. And so um, that actually kind of goes back to my point about college. Like there's this weird, like rigid structure. I think um, you want to create your own sort of structures or like a fluid way to like work with people right i think in college they tell you to go to like a lab and like work with a professor and like there are these older people that are that'll mentor or guide you and that's just not true like that you necessarily need that sort of structure a lot of times it's like way better if you just you know you have like a peer or like someone maybe younger than you that is like interesting and like you guys jam and i think I think of it as like jamming. It's like you just want to jam with a bunch of different people and like whatever like strikes, like whoever just seems to be a great um, creative or technical counterpart. Um, it's, it's sort of like you want to feel that synergy and then um, try a couple projects together. So it's not like you need to find your co-founder today or in this cohort. Um, there's time to explore and you can trial it. Um, and then when the time comes, you might, for us, we like fell into building the company, but you can make a, um, more thoughtful decision around it. Got it. So your approach is sort of, I know you kind of mentioned this, but it's a project-based approach. Do you think there's sort of room for testing out how you actually work with this, with, with this team before you really kind of dive into something more, more long-term? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's nice because there's no deadline. There's no course that you're trying to do this for. And you sometimes like things will naturally fall off. Like, um, and the best test is like, you guys are in college, people are busy with their lives. And if, the project continues to live and you guys get together and you're excited about it over eight months and maybe there's ebbs and flows right like some weeks maybe you just don't do anything but if you keep feeling that energy like that is a really good sign um, that you can work with this person and a similar question i guess <clears throat> related to this um teams i think over the last few days we've chatted i've chatted with grace and said sort of about this notion of teamwork and how 
we really sort of found out each other, how we work together. Uh, but that took sort of a while to figure out where our strengths are, where we can kind of pick up each other's slack. I guess, how do you, what do you think about teamwork in the college environment? I would say a lot of students come in maybe with a notion of teamwork that isn't quite good in the sense where if you haven't had the experience of working on a, on a real good team before, you might think that it's not for you. So I guess, were you sort of someone who was more solo oriented before you met someone who you really clicked with? Or did you always sort of know you were looking for someone who you could build out with? Yeah. I think this might give some people solace, but I was not someone who was class president or um, like, you know, in high school, um, never had good teams. Like I always felt like I had to do a lot of the work and um, in clubs, like wasn't really the type of person who wanted to head something up. Um, and so actually like, I think there's like many forms, like ultimately you find the co-founder or co-founders that just like compliment you just right. And then starting a company, um, being like a leader or CEO, it um, it doesn't have to look like what you, you know, people like schools tell you a leader looks like. Um, and so, I'd say my style has always been more, um, in general, like quiet. Um, just do the work. Um, do the work. I think is basically the same as like lead by example. Um, you pull the weight, and then people you hire or work with, they they're the types where they see that and they feel the pressure to do the same. Um, they're not dead weight. And then generally, I think um, part of finding uh, teamwork or like the right synergies is understanding, um, yet again, like psychology, but I think it goes a bit deeper. It's like everyone has their style of working, of leading, of doing, um, of participating in conflict. I think this is something that school doesn't teach well is like, how do you actually have good conflict? Because doing a company, starting a company is, um, it's not possible to have a, like a smiling happy relationship with everyone you work with like it's gonna have I'd say like 60% uh, not 60% of the time there's conflict but it's like there's always like there's gonna be a push and pull like tension is good for getting work done um, and so in tension not as in like people are mad at each other but tension as in like you like someone is pushing a bit harder and like other people feel like they're being pulled or pushed along um, and so I think that was something that was interesting um, that I found I had to work on a lot as I um, kind of grew as a person and a founder. Um, and participating in conflict, it's um, ultimately comes down to like the way you communicate, the way you listen to the other person and other people. Um, it's not about fighting, actually. Um, so conflict, I think, is interesting as like a way of growing. You've mentioned now <clears throat> several times sort of this idea of having that range, so not sort of just being hyper-specialized, but also having a little bit of, you're saying in your business experience, you've used sort of psychology and you use general econ and entrepreneurial practices, right? Um, you're big on systems, so I guess my question is, do you have a system for sort of cultivating that range consistently throughout your days, or is it more of like a spontaneous thing in that white space? I actually do, it's pretty bad. I'm a very, um, so I, I keep a system where um, I try to cultivate habits. So some of the daily habits that I now um, try to do is one, find artistic inspiration. So that could either be architecture, like this building is really interesting actually. Um, I know like Joe Sai, he kind of started this whole thing. He's someone who is very like cross-disciplinary, like he owns sports teams, like is interested in a lot of things in philanthropy. Philanthropy, so you know, this could be the thing I write down today is like interesting. I dig into. I'm very much into like Wikipedia rabbit holes, um, so that would count as my like inspiration there. Um, the second is I actually try to read a technical paper or like scientific paper. I think part of it for me is like you know I feel like I didn't learn that much um, in these like academic institutions, so I try to make up for it. Um, and so I'll read those papers, write some notes, keep up with the latest. Um, and then I have a couple other things, but those are kind of the two main ones where um, they're pretty like they're pretty broad. So with the art one, it's anything that's just like not in the sciences. And with this, um, the paper one, I'll read papers on like recently, obviously a lot of AI, but sometimes it's like acoustics, like physics. Um, sometimes it's like material design, um, and that kind of comes back, right? Like recently we had a customer who um, he they run like a brand and they use pretty cool like um uh, you know animal or not animal skins but like alternative endangered species stuff 
And so I'd just been reading something in like a similar space. And so you can kind of bring those conversations to help you with getting along with people better, like establishing a connection, or you can bring those into your own thinking. It's like, how can I um, apply it? Like, I actually really like the colors in here. Like we've been thinking about some of the branding stuff around alloy and it's like, these colors are very calming. Um, they make me think a bit, like how can we use it for certain um, brand marketing activities? So a lot of stuff, right? Like you just, I think part of it is just being more, um, just more thoughtful in your daily life. I think um, for me, I do a tiny bit of meditation. I'm honestly not um, like a Silicon Valley archetype in that sense. I, I, can, I can't do meditation well, so still working on that. But I think ultimately it's just about um, being present, thoughtful about the things you see and bringing that into your work. Nice. Um, I just have a few more questions. Just, I'm curious, you, you've mentioned this concept of chaos in your opening speech. Um, and I love it because I think it, it's a word that kind of embodies the way that a lot of things happen at college, sort of <laughs> a lot of the things that end up being meaningful and purposeful sort of stem out of these really chaotic environments, chaotic meaning things you can't really expect. So how do you, I guess, other than sort of just being out there and trying to talk to people, how do you put yourself in environments that you hope will cultivate some chaos? Yeah, um, <laughs> I guess I did have a bit of a like chaotic um, two years for a bit. So I actually, um, I didn't like signing leases for a while for some reason. I didn't really want to grow up. I felt like I was in this odd, I was in this odd state of just, uh, <laughs> they heard chaos. chaos. And <laughs> Um, so yeah, I actually, I lived uh, between, so had like, I think moved between six spots. I was in SF, I did YC when it was still in person, pandemic hit, lived in, um, and then moved to LA, was in Miami for a bit, and then New York, and then went back to LA. So a lot of like, I think for me, um, physical environments helped me a lot. Um, but also, I, I think different physical environments, they introduce you to um, different people. So in LA, I actually spent a lot of time with um, some really interesting uh, creatives, right? Like Mr. Beast's like manager was pretty cool. Like some folks, like um, Patreon founders, a friend, um, and so a lot of that where you just like kind of airdrop yourself. Like I had no idea what the scene in LA was like, but I decided to just live in West Hollywood, right on Fairfax. I actually lived um, like a block away from Supreme. So on Thursday morning, I would walk out in my PJs, and there'd be like a whole line, and I would you know sometimes like look in and talk to someone. Um, and there are all these like random chance encounters where um, you can generally know like where to put yourself. It's like, um, if I want to dive into the film scene, I should probably go to Sundance this year. Um, I probably have like two friends who can get me into interesting things and then from there explore that scene. Um, so I, I do think like the perspective is, um, yeah, like whenever you feel ready, like your um, like works in a good place, you should absolutely um, just bring some chaos into your life. Uh, be a different person for a bit, try that out. It's like trying a costume, right? I love that. And just as a closing question, I guess, you're speaking to an audience of a hundred first years and some student leaders, most, mostly people who are sort of starting out their Yale experience. So over the next month, right, it's a chaotic month, there's a lot happening. What's some advice you have or one thing you maybe recommend that, that these students maybe try in the next month or so um, in order to I don't know, just things you think, something you think is cool. Yeah, um, good question. I'm like thinking about what you guys have in New Haven at Yale. Um, I think first off, the mentality you should have is just um, like absorb, like listen. Um, you want to try to capture and just make sure, like, because I guess one, one of my philosophies is we all like live these lives, like you have 18 years in you, but how wise and knowledgeable you are is dependent on how much of those 18 years you've absorbed, like the experiences. And so you don't want this to go to waste, right? Like your first month of chaos, you wanna make sure that you kind of remember the key things. Um, so I know it sounds like absurd, but just keep like a little, like a notion or a log or something. Um, and you can just write like a little sentence, like maybe each day, like what got you to think, what um, inspired you, maybe something someone mentioned, just write it down just enough context so that you can go back in a year and be like, oh wow, like that thing got me thinking. Um, because I think in college you actually get just like way more of these sources of inspiration than you do once you're in like a 
uh, like a desk job or whatever it is that you end up doing. Um, and I think w in terms of like a concrete thing to try out, um, I recommend like, like maybe you guys have like an inkling of the majors or the things you want to do or the internships you want to have. But um, if you've ever thought about something very different, just like try to talk to like a professor or person, like maybe not, not the, I know Yale has like um, a school of religion. I don't know much about religion, uh, but like maybe something else like wander into a lab. Um, yeah, have some deep conversations with people. Amazing. Well, Sarah, thank you so, so much. Huge round of applause for Sarah.